Nice. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Uh, hopefully, we won't have too much to talk about. We'll see. Uh, so, first up, uh, you know, there's always a lot of churn at BU uh, during the ad drop. Uh, if you started after September 12th, you have until next Tuesday to complete all the like homeworks and lives and stuff that was due prior to you starting. So the homework that's due on Thursday, you actually have till Tuesday. The one that was due last Thursday, you have till Tuesday. You get the idea. Uh, if you can't figure out what I mean, uh, ask one of your neighbors. Um, and uh, we'll be doing great sort of extensions, uh, but it's a very manual process. So if you can't get access to it by, let's say, um thursday like thursday's lecture uh either catch one of us after class or send us an email end of the day thursday uh and just remind us that you started after that and you need the extension um i think that's all i say about that uh if you still can't access the scc uh please see us immediately after class today uh and We'll kind of sort out when when we can fix it. We can either do it immediately or we can do it in the future, depending on the problem. All right, any questions? Okay. Uh, I want to go over two, maybe three things uh, that seem to come up a lot in the homework. So when we talk about uh, like a number line, right? If you think about zero, you know, kind of being the middle or somewhere in the middle, then you can kind of think about it. The uh, negative number right, is how far it is, uh, you know, to my left side of the zero. Uh, the positive number is how far it is the right side of the zero. All right. So that kind of indicates a distance in the direction. Okay. But a lot of times all we care about is a distance. So all we care about is how far away five is from 10, right? Not necessarily whether it's a positive, whether we're going positive or going negative. That's what the absolute value is for. So a lot of the questions in, uh, I think, particularly homework two, kind of reference distance, okay? And you should be thinking about distance rather than thinking about the direction of that distance. Does that make sense? Right? Because if you try to average a bunch of negative numbers together with a bunch of positive numbers, you're going to get a different value, right? Than if you're just looking at the average distance between things. So that was the first thing that came up. Um, there's another thing that came up that I can't now remember. Um, but then another item uh, somebody asked me about was the exam format kind of structure. So the midterm exam, it's on the syllabus whenever it is, sometime not, you know, not today in the future. I don't remember. Um, I'm very bad with dates if you haven't figured it out already. Uh, there is before today and after tomorrow, right? That's what I usually remember. Um, so midterms on the syllabus, whenever it is, it is in class. Okay, like it's in this room, so that should be awkward as you know. Uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll try to figure out uh, some more instructions for you. Um, midterm review, depending on how we're doing on lectures, so how fast we're getting through the lectures. I will do a midterm review in class if we're ahead enough on lectures. If we're not, then uh, the, there will be a midterm review during the discussion section. The midterm review during the discussion section will happen either way. It's just whether or not you get two. Okay. Um, the midterm itself does have a midterm review guide, which we'll distribute in probably a week or two, maybe a little bit further. Uh, it has some bugs in it that we need to fix before we distribute it. Um, so there is a midterm review guide that should be helpful. It was actually created by a prior class uh, as an extra credit project. Um, and the, the really one is the one we're distributing, and we think it's really, really good. Uh, hopefully, you appreciate it. Uh, please let us know if you have any feedback on it. We would always like to make it better if you think there's stuff missing. Uh, so that's the midterm review guide and kind of how to set up for the midterm. The midterm will be in two components. Okay? There is stuff that I want you to kind of have memorized. As a result, that part of the midterm will be written. Okay, So paper, pen, pencil, whatever you like. Um, and we'll actually handwrite the answers. It'll be mostly be things like definitions or like matching definitions, so that kind of stuff. The stuff like the word treatment, I want you to know what it means, okay? The second part of the exam, and I hesitate to say half because the written part should be like, you know, maybe a third, maybe a quarter, and the rest of the time will probably be spent on the, on the other part, which would be a Jupyter notebook, very much like the homeworks, very much like the labs. Um, 
But because it's a Jupyter notebook, it's pretty much open web, right? Like I don't really have any control over keeping you off of the internet. So as a result, it's open. So that's why I do a written portion to get you to get memorized stuff. However, just because it's open doesn't mean that you can Google every answer, okay? And the reason is for two things. One, some of the questions are thinking, right? So you will be able to find the answer on the open web. And two, if you have to look up every single answer, you will not finish in time, okay? So open web does not equal don't study. That makes sense? You there? Anyone? Y'all ready? All right, all right, got a little bit. Um, I swear there was something else, but I forget what it was. Um, so a little bit of apology on this. Um, I realized after the fact that we didn't get to this in the last lecture, that would have been made the homework this week much easier. Um, so, uh, you know, so if you really have, you know, no heads or tails on the range of stuff, luckily you have until Thursday to complete the homework. So hopefully this will help. And we'll talk about rangers, rangers um, in theory. All right. So going to Jupyter Notebook, um, you should have a class version of it. Uh, it's very blank again this time. So there's not a lot already there. Make sure that works. All right. So the first thing we did talk a little bit about make array, right? So make array, and we can do it by hand, right? And all this does is make an array. Um, and if this ever runs, do -do -do. Uh, this is this is going to be an unfun uh, lecture if we have no internet. Um, all right. So what this will do is we'll create an array. Okay. And just for anybody who has a Python background, I think I mentioned this last time. Um, this array that it creates is not quite the same as the array that you get if you just put parens. Um, so just keep that in mind. This is the one coming out of NumPy. So and this is the one we're going to use for this class. Uh, it has certain constraints on it. Most of you don't need to worry about it. Just if you have Python backgrounds, keep in mind, this is not the same kind of array. Um, all right. So, oh, look, it finally ran. Yay. Okay. The next thing I'm going to mention, oh, but so it has elements here, right? Um, and actually, let me run this one more time. Risk the demo gods. Oh, look at that. that was quick. Okay. So if you notice here, right, this is zero to four. Okay. So it starts at the zeroth position, and it like it counts up to four. But if you notice, there's actually five things, right? So this is a common, common error. Okay, I mentioned last time my terribly bad joke about the off by one error. Um, so there's five elements, but they go zero to four. So keep that in mind that you know those two things don't match. So in other words, if you do length on this, right? We talked about length. If you do length on this, you're going to get five but the top position is four. So whenever you're trying to index the last position, which you often are, it's gonna be length minus one. That makes sense? Okay, so thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is this handy function, okay? Where we say, let's just do seven, okay? Oh boy, that's not it. Okay, so it is tempting to read this as a range, which makes you think that it's going to like sort things, like the word arrange, but it's not that. That word has two R's. This should be read as a range. So it is going to create a range. So by default, if you give it a, a number like this, it's going to give you a range of digits from zero to six. Okay. So what we call this is exclusive of the last number, okay, versus inclusive. So if I if this was an inclusive function, I would end up with zero to seven, right? But because it's exclusive for the end, it means that it's going to be up to six. So in other words, it's going to give us seven things, which is what we're asking for here, except because they start at zero, it's only going to go up to six. Same thing is up here, just that you can do it a little bit more quickly. Without having to type it in. 
However, the function's a little handier than that. Actually, it's a lot handier than that. Um, and we can actually do, let's just use the example on my cheat sheet. We can actually give it a starting position. So I only give it one parameter, right? one argument, and I got seven elements. If I give it two, then it's going to go start the first number I give it, and then it's going to go up to 11, okay? Except that it's still exclusive, okay? So in other words, for consistency's sake, you won't actually get the number 11 over there, okay? Does that make sense? Yes? All right, all right, uh, cool. All right, then the last thing you can do with this cool function, well, there's probably, probably has more arguments, but for the sake of this class, uh, let's do 5, 11, 2. All right, anybody have a guess as to what that's going to get us for the result? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have phrased it quite that way, but you are correct. So it's not, it's not going to go, it's, it's not going through it twice. It's going to go every other number, right? Because it's going to skip by two. Usually in most programming lingo, you often refer to this as the skip by, okay? Oh, that comes from, it seems a little like, you know, uh, third grade to me, but, you know. Uh, so five to 11, skipping by two. And so, we start inclusively by the first digit, then we jump two, jump two, but we're exclusive on the end, right? So we don't get the last, we don't get the 11. Okay, so it's always inclusive on the beginning and exclusive on the end, All right? Let's see. Um, oh, and you can also do more sophisticated versions. So you can do kind of any numbers you want. So let's do zero to one, but let's skip by zero point one. Okay, so you're not limited to uh, uh, integers. You can also use floats, etc. Okay, and it'll do kind of what you expect it to do. Um, and then I have an example of, of what I just talked about. But if I have, um, you know. Let's do A equals NP A range eight. Oh boy, where was I typing? Huh, no idea. All right, how about A equals NP A range eight? Right, and then um, if I print A, and then if I say, a dot item eight, what's gonna happen? What am I gonna get? Hence, let's see right and left. Will we get seven or will we get an error? So right hand will be error, uh, left hand will be seven. This is there is no bias. I don't have anything against left handers except the weird. All right, everybody, put your hand up. What do you got? All right, the error is correct. As you'll see. Oh, boy. Not that kind of error. Let's see if we can get this to actually clear. This tank all together. Oh, it's somehow managed to change to a raw, probably because I couldn't type. Or well, arguably, that's still an error. So this should give us an error eventually, okay, because... Remember, it's exclusive of that top number. Okay, so it won't have the number eight in the range. So, uh, as I think I've also mentioned before, this problem plagues me to this day. I, I will always have this problem. I can't count. And here is evidence. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right, so... Here is a little bit more formally arranged an array of consecutive numbers. Um, you know, if you just pass one number, you, that's the end point, okay? Or the end. Um, I actually almost tend to think of it as the count, right? To try to fix my brain on whether or not that's inclusive or exclusive. Um, then you can also do start and end, or you can do start and step. Um, I actually thought it said in the slide skip by, but um, it's often referred to as the step. 
Uh, so in this terminology, it's a little bit more kind of, you know, you might have some math background here. If you ever use summa, uh, summa sorry, um, you can have steps as well. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to talk about. Um, an arrange with step between consecutive values, uh, the range will always include start, but excludes the end. Okay. All right. And we have a question. Eventually. Where's my mouse? Why does it just say keyword default? Uh, okay. The question is, if you pass in um, MP A range paren eight paren. Just look at if it could cut off. I don't know where it went. Um, what will be in the first position? What will start it? Or another way to think about the same question is if you do make array and pass in some values, what will be the first position? If you want to index into the very first position, what number is it? Or what position is it? Top hat is really annoying me. All right. Most guys, most of you have put it in. So responses is zero. That is correct. Okay. The first position is always zero. All right. So let's talk about tables. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how you create a table from scratch. We've talked about this a little bit, um, but here we're going to talk about it a little bit more in more detail. So I'm going to cut and paste this one uh, for those of you who are trying to follow along. Um, what you put in these elements doesn't matter that much as long as they are strings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a array of various landmarks on the B campus. Okay. Hopefully you all know where all of these are. Um, even if you don't care for pavement. Somebody, I think it was somebody in this class expressed very strong dislike for pavement. Um, all right, but in order to create a table, I just do this. And if anybody, oh boy, if anybody has uh, taken a pass at, at the homework or looked at it too much, you'll probably have seen this already. But basically that is gonna create a thing that is the table, okay? However, I'm not assigning it to anything, so in this case, I'm just throwing it away. All right. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it to something called campus, which is going to be a table with column landmark, landmark. Nope. And I'm going to put that array directly in here. Okay. So now I have a table called campus that has one column called landmarks. And I can see it by just doing it again, the meant to do in the first place. And so now you can see I have a table, one column has four elements that are those landmarks we typed in before. Like I said, if you're trying to follow along, don't worry about what the actual landmarks are, you get the idea. All right, so then what we can do is we can actually add in more columns to this table by doing campus dot with column blocks from marsh plaza Let me just see. Yeah. Great. Conveniently, oops. Oh, thank you. It's really hard to type when it's over your shoulder. Um, all right. Conveniently, or not conveniently, oh, I guess it's wrong. I'm thinking it was correct. Um, 
but so I'm just going to shove in there, uh, you know, zero, one, two, three, okay, and just call that correct. Um, obviously, I could put a new array there that would actually have the correct number of blocks, but this is the example, so I don't care. All right, so however, the question is, now if I print a campus table, what do I get? Anybody? Uh, the first one without the like uh, distance because you never would set the uh, variable to G. Right. So I never assigned it to campus. So now it's right there. So why don't we assign it so that we can actually change the table? And we just do that the same way we do everything else. <laughs> uh, except I forgot to print it. Right, and so now it has our landmarks. Um, oh, I must have typed it wrong in the first place. I thought I had said landmarks, not landmark. Um, actually, there is a good note here. Um, generally speaking, a column will be called something uh, singular because it's the position, or like it's the individual one, right? Um, even though you'll refer to the set as landmarks, you'd usually call the column landmark. All right, now we have a couple of other things we can do that are handy. Uh, let me just hit plus up here. Good gracious, I need a hard line. Um, so now I can also do labels, which will show me the column names, okay? Remember we called them labels earlier uh, in an lecture? Uh, and then so that's how you can retrieve them. Um, but we can also find out how many columns we have. And we can also find out how many rows we have. Okay. And I just printed it like this for convenience. You know, you can do them on two separate lines or whatever, but it will only print the last thing. But so this basically what I did was I uh, just kind of displayed them both by just throwing a comma in there. Um, so two columns, four rows. Okay, so this can be really handy when you want to do something like an average, right? Because you want to know how many there are, although I would usually use the MP average. Um, let me just check my slide and figure out if we're going on. Yeah, so we're going to go back to the slides. And all right, so the way we create a table. Oh, wait, was I supposed to show? Oh, oops. Jump the gun. Hold on. All right, so what we can also do is read a table from a file. All right, and this is what we've done a bunch already. Okay, and in this case, we're going to read this table. And I'm going to use an equal sign, not a minus. Okay, and so what this means is. Nearby where I am, okay, and uh, it would probably be easier for you, but um, because I have a whole mess of files in there. Um, but if you look in that directory that was LECO5, right, in there you open the IPYMD file, but also in there were several C CSV files, right? So that's a comma separated value file, all right? And let me just see if. Uh, hopefully, I have the right profile. Yes. Um. Where is this? That's if I can type, sorry. Whoops. Oh. 
Um, this is why I try to prepare everything in advance, but I forgot. I like to show this off. I don't know how bad the colors are here. All right. But this is what's literally in that CSV file. Okay. So it is comma separated values. Okay. So it's just a text file. You can open it with Notepad. You can open it with Microsoft Word if you really wanted to. Um, but it just has the columns, right, with a label at the top and each of the values for each row. And they're all just separated by commas. Okay. So that's all that's in those CSV files. And so it's very hard to display that actually in Jupyter Notebook because it tries to make it look pretty. Um, but so when it does that, it just does kind of what you would expect, which is all those columns and rows, it just dumps them into a table. Um, and let me just print this. Oh my goodness. Right. And so now we have, you know, these various columns, but now it's laid out a little more prettily and we can do all those operations on it. Right. We can say, you know, dot labels. We can say num rows. We can say num columns. We can go select a column. We can do a row. We can do all those operations that we couldn't do on the text file itself. Does that make sense? Okay. So all we're doing is trying to load it in. But what I want to point out is uh, how much I love hitting dismiss all the time is this is a string oops here okay which is just the name of the file all right and then we use this method called read table which takes the name of a file um and loads it in as a table and then returns that to this dubois uh object okay so now this thing is the table yeah what you're doing, it's always giving me the same error that like the name table isn't defined. So you run the first uh, cell. <laughs> or the team must be capitalized. Yeah, and the team must be capitalized. Okay. Yeah, one thing that's a good point. Um, for the vast majority of the cases in when you're doing something in programming or whatever, case matters, okay? Especially if you're coming from a Windows background where case doesn't matter, okay? On Mac, on Linux, whenever you're programming, case almost always matters. Okay, so make sure that T on the table is capital. And I call this thing D U underscore B O I S. If I made that capital D, it wouldn't work. Okay, so case makes a difference. Um, yeah, all right, so let me go back to the table. Is there a reason you sometimes put spaces on either side of equal sign and sometimes not? Laziness. Yeah. Um, when I'm, you know, when I'm trying to program something that is uh, going to be seen by others, I try to make it look nice. Uh, and so I'll put the spaces in. If I'm doing something fast and dirty, I'll tend not to. Um, it's more, it's, if you see me be inconsistent here, it's more because I miss the key. Um, but it doesn't actually make a difference. Yeah. Um, Trying to think, it's say, oh, that was, yeah. And something else that came up is you know, some of the homework questions end up with really long answers. You can actually break lines into multiple lines, to, it's like sometimes. So, whenever you see, if I can find my mouse, like a dot, oops, wrong side. Nope, not on a dot. Um, so you can break a line by just doing this, except, no, it's still not gonna work. I don't think. Oh, that's it. Okay, so a slash means continue on the next line, but usually you're doing it with something bigger like this, right? And so you can do things like that, okay? And that. Basically, the, the trick to know if you're kind of doing it right is you see how it got tabbed in kind of automatically? I didn't do that. It just did it when I hit enter. 
that's an indicator that it'll probably work. Okay, but just keep in mind that sometimes you can break lines. There is a whole like um, specification about how that works, but you can kind of like experiment with it. If it's not working, try just using the slash. Um, or the other trick is doing pieces. There's no reason that you have to do every command in one line. Okay, so like for this one, um, this isn't a good example. This one, you pretty much have to do it in one line because I'm declining a column, right? But let's say I was doing like five columns at once. Okay, there's no reason I have to do that each in one line. I can say campus add column, right? Campus equals, you know, next column, campus equals next column, and do them as separate lines. The reason I bring this up is because it can be often a lot easier to figure out where you have a mistake if you can kind of see it laid out a little more nicely. Okay, so experimental. Um, it's pretty forgiving, um, but you'll get a very obvious error if you did it wrong. Okay, in that it'll say, Oh, I can't find the second half of this command. So, MakeArray is um, has some wrappers around it to make sure it works well with tables. So, you know, if, if you really want to know the detail answer, uh, come to office hours and I can explain it. Um, but in short, uh, it makes arrays a bit easier to use in this class. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go back to the slides. Um, so, all right. So when it's a create a table, you can read a table and you give it the file name. Okay. Except it has to be a string. Uh, it reads a table from a spreadsheet or a CSV or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you will often hear me use these terms kind of interchangeably um, because most of the spreadsheets I deal with are CSVs. But you know, Google Sheets, right? You can actually in file in the file menu, you can actually download a CSV in Google Sheets. You can also convert it in Excel if you want to. Um, it's just another format of storing the data on disk. Um, but then you can also just create an empty table if you want, and then you can kind of manually add columns, um, which I'm fairly certain is in the homework. Um, and then you can do whatever you want to on that new table. Okay, just keep in mind that unless you assign one of those to something else, it's just going to throw it away after that line. So you got to make sure you assign it to another name if you want to keep it around. All right. And now we have a question. This one managed to get the actual question. That's helpful. All right. So if you want to read a table named seat times.csv, how would you do that? Need more typing. All right, that's most of you. Spin an answer. All right, so all right, the correct all right, so. Uh, a couple of notes. Um, did I can't remember if this checks casing correctly or not. Okay, but technically speaking, this is actually not correct. This should be capital T. Um, but table, you must have the parentheses. Okay. No, wait. 
No, I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I was like, this seems wrong. It's this one, this is correct. Okay, so this is correct, except it has to have the capital T, okay? So ignore the fact that it's wrong. I must have checked the wrong box. Um, so this needs to be a capital T, but otherwise, this is how you do it. You do read table, and it's a method directly on the thing called table. This indicates create a new thing, okay? So you could do, for example, table paren, paren dot with column, for example, and you could add a column to a table, and it would create a new table first, and then add a column to it. But this one will actually read it from a CSV file. I literally went through these a few hours ago and checked them and apparently still made a mistake. So this one's right, despite what it tells you, except that it should be a capital T. All right. Um, this one also got a mistake in it. How come I can tell when I'm looking at it when I'm up here talking to y'all, but I can't tell when I'm looking at it in my office? Um, so I'm just going to skip that one. All right, so let's talk about W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, anybody know who this is? Super famous American. Uh, yes, it's not what not what they not what he's super famous for though. Any other guesses? Probably. Uh, no. Um, if you look at those dates, uh, it would be a little bit difficult. Yeah. African American like the white activist. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, a writer in the sense that the way he did his stuff was by writing, right? But he's not known like Mark Twain is for being a writer. He's known as um, you know civil rights activist, kind of, except well predating the civil rights movement. So it wasn't really called that as much as like. Um, you know, just kind of an activist, let's say, or really trying to shine a light on, on various problems. Uh, the most famous thing he's, he's known for in the U.S. Uh, is probably being the founder of NAACP. Um, so I'm not going to give you the expansion of that. You can look it up, but I'm not using some of those words in the modern era. Um, and so scholar, historian, activist, and interestingly for this class, right, data scientist. Uh, and that's mostly what we're going to talk about in terms of him. Uh, he's actually really interesting, so it's worthwhile going to, you know, check out his Wikipedia page, you know, read a biography. Um, and so, so, but what was interesting about him and why I kind of clarify about civil rights and, and that kind of thing, what he was really trying to do is get people to, to see the kind of human condition of Black Americans and use that mechanism as activism, right? So he wasn't doing marches in DC. Instead, he was trying to publish lots of information about like what people's lives are like so that people's conscience would kind of do the activism. Does that make sense? And that's kind of why I clarify that it's not quite, not quite the same as the civil rights movement. Um, he did lots and lots of photographs um, and has a whole mess of patents. Um, but what we really care about is the 60 plus handmade graphs that he made in three months. Okay. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not the artist for that. Right. So, um, and so this is one of his original things. Okay. And being original, it's a little hard to see um, because it's kind of old. Um, but we have it a little bit more clearly here um, in that I kind of labeled the individual things. So what I want to point out is basically what he did was he said, okay, we're going to classify people based on income, okay? And then we're going to, um, and then these are the actual averages within that income range. Then we're going to say, okay, how much is this group spending on rent? How much is this spending on food, clothes, taxes, and other, okay? And just to show you a little bit better, it's still pretty illegible, um, but these are the income categories. So $100 to $200 uh, a week, 
no, I mean, sorry, um, maybe a, I think it was a month. Um, I'm just trying to think what my slide is next. Um, and then, you know, so basically these kind of different income bands, okay? So poorest of the poor, and then kind of richest of the rich, okay? Um, and then he kind of showed how money, how people were spending the money. And so specifically, this is about 150 families in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so he collected this actual data, went out and talked to 150 families. Um, and, you know, and then made a signal out of it. I wish I could remember how much, how often this was. Um, but so 19% on rent, 43% on you know, food. Yeah, food. Um, and then clothes. And then other. Oh, wait, I missed one. Taxes. So as you can see, so, uh, so anything that leaks out at you about this data? Like what, what's interesting here? Once they start making over the, the second from the, bottom, the one below that, they stop paying rent right, because they own houses. So 750 to 1,000, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it looks like they stopped paying rent as a material or a, like any portion. And instead, they own places, right? So that changes the dynamic because when you're renting a place, right, you can't hand that down to family members. If you own a place, you can hand it off. All right, others? Maybe the richer you get, the more money you spend on like other things. Right. So the, the richer, you know, the further down you are here, the more kind of discretionary income you have, right? So you can spend on things like education or on um, you know other kinds of advancement or, or um, uh, I want to say frivolous, but not frivolous activities, but you know things that you do for fun, right? Um, I think I saw somebody's hand over there. Yeah. Um, taxes go up from the poorest to the second, but then the wealthiest pays less taxes than the middle. Right. Okay. So. Does anybody know what, what kind of tax this is where it's not flat? Progressive. Yeah, it's a progressive tax. So there's two general categories of taxes. One's called progressive, one's called regressive. Um, progressive taxes being they progress basically in terms of like income. Okay, so they go up, generally speaking. But the idea of it is that, and this is part of what this uh, graph is trying to show you, is that these people or even these people, 4% of their income has a much higher impact, or like the same dollar amount on this group has a much higher impact on their ability to buy clothes and rent and stuff like that than it does on these people, okay? So progressive taxes try to take into account uh, the fact that, you know, if I make $1,000, okay, then, you know, like this last class, and I spend $5 of it on taxes, that's a very different experience than if I make $100 and spend $5 on taxes. That makes sense? A flat tax is often considered what's called regressive, which means that everyone pays an equal amount, which seems fair. The problem is that it's considered regressive because it doesn't, it doesn't help, you know, it doesn't cause the same amount of harm to all the different groups. So that's an interesting point, except what's interesting, right, is that the highest group still pays a very small amount. They pay almost as small amount as the second lowest group. So if it's a true progressive tax, you expect it to grow all the way through the income levels. That makes sense? Uh, all right, anything else? For the most part, food is tends to be one of the larger categories, if not the largest, depending on the income level. Right, so food is a very big impact on, on basically their Overall expenditure. Um, that's also uh, very like really interesting. Um, but as you can see down here, right, um, because the amount of money, the the food expenditure is probably actually fairly fixed for the same family size, right? You can only eat so much. Even if all that so much is all lobster, the price difference is just not that high. So as a result, it becomes a smaller percentage of your overall income as you get wealthier, because look, you can only eat so much, okay? And this is all kind of assuming families are roughly the same size and all of this. All right, anything else? All right, so 
one thing I don't point out about this is look how much information we can get from this graph. Okay, this is kind of goes to that term of like, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words because we can get so much information here that if we were looking at, and we will, uh, if we're looking at this, it's much harder to parse or kind of see all those conclusions or another way I'll put it is, this is data, right? Get my slides right. This is information, okay? They're technically the same, right? But there's so much more here than would be just given by that table of data, okay? You can get to here, right? It's all true. It's just that you immediately can take away significantly more information with this picture or graph or whatever, um, then you can just put it full of data. Does that make sense? Okay, so a lot of what we'll do in this class is figure out how we can like share the information from the data that we've collected, okay, or found or whatever. All right, so let me, actually before we do that, let's go back here. All right, so you know one of the questions you might have, right, is let me just see. So one of the things we want to know, right, is that how do we like kind of extrapolate that information using the computer? Because yeah, we have a pretty small data set here, right? I mean, we only talk to 150 families. We were doing the same thing today. We would probably be looking at thousands of families, right? If not tens of thousands of families to feel like we got data sets that were useful, okay? 150 families in Atlanta, it, you know, in whatever it was, 1850 or something, you know, like, okay, like that's probably plausible as, as representative of something. Whereas we tried to do that in Boston, right, today, or, like people would laugh at you because it's just, it's nowhere near enough information to actually come to any kind of conclusions. Um, so, why? Oh, sorry, I was misreading a column and, and getting very confused about what we want to do. Um, okay, so, Let's look at the individual columns. So the first thing we can do is look at these status. How did I manage that? Um, so if we look at the status column, right, we have a bunch of different, um, I don't know, stati? What's the plural status? Statuses? Statuses. Um, so we have a bunch of different ones. But let's say we want to know something about those groups. Uh, for example, who paid the highest percentage on rent? Um, actually, let me. Actually, let's do a different one because um, that's what I have like pre-done code for. Um, so let's look at how much people are spending on food by doing something like this okay because what we can do let me print this so it's a little bit easier is as you'll recall right if we extract the column from an individual table we have the actual average for example and we're going to pull out the food and if we multiply those two columns what we've extracted right is two arrays so we can multiply two arrays together so then i'm just going to print out food dollars but now we can say, okay, the actual average. So in other words, the number one we were talking about up here, this is the range of this class, but the actual average income is $139.10. Um, and so as a result, we're gonna use that to figure out what percentage of their uh, uh, income is spent on food. So 
we multiply those together and we find out that, okay, the food dollars they spend is, you know, just shy of 60 bucks in that first category. So then we can actually add that column now that we know, now that we have that as an array, we can actually add that to our table. And now we can actually see that for each of these classes, what is the percentage that we spend on food, okay? Or actually, sorry, what's the dollar amount we spend on food? I said it backwards. Um, because we have the percentage, but we want to know what is it in kind of real dollars that we are going to get in that food, you know, when they spend it on food. Um, but let me assign it so that we don't lose that data. Yeah. But now I forgot to print it again. All right, however, um, so yeah, so kind of just show off some more things. So, so you can imagine, right, that we can actually do this for each of the columns, and then we can know what the real dollar value is if we wanted to say, do another plot, and we want to actually show on average how much are they actually spending for each of these elements, not just necessarily as a percentage of their income, which tells us something different. Personally, I'm not sure that this would actually be as powerful as the percentage of income is in the graphs, right? Because this number, I don't think, would give you as much of a kind of a feeling of how much is being used by each of those groups. Um, so that's why I think it's kind of interesting where you can calculate a lot of different kinds of data, but it's not always the best thing to show. So you have to think through what you want to actually show off because different uh, ways of presenting Technically, all the same information has different outcomes in people's perception of that data. Okay, and this goes back to the first lecture or second lecture or something. You know, we talk about bull shrimp, right? This is where we can affect how the consumer of our graph or grid or whatever takes what they take away from it. Okay, so and this is one of the ways we can do that. Um, one of the things that I want to show off or show you because it's handy um, is that, and I'm going to cut and paste this one. Um, but one of the things that's not obvious in this table, right? And I even said it backwards, um, is that these are actually percentages, right? Not real values. So what you can do is actually you can set a format, okay, on a table, and now it'll actually print that column as a percentage, okay? So again, going back to when you're trying to present information to people, it's helpful if at a glance, you know what the information is rather than having to parse through that, oh, this is actually a percentage, right? Because if you look at the number, right, 0 0.18, that's not what they're spending on clothes. That's clearly not a dollar amount. So likely it's a percentage. But you don't want to have someone to have to figure that out because it's it can be disingenuous. People can come to the wrong conclusion, right? Um, and also at a glance, you want people to be able to take in as much information as they can, even when you're using something like a table. Um, and I will tell you, even for yourself, even when you know the data, when if you can kind of lay it out correctly, it will be uh, easier for you to understand it. Um, and just when uh, I think in Piazza, but you know these these objects all have lots of different methods on them that are available to use, and there's a bunch of different kinds of formatters that you can use there for other types of things. Like if you want to display, you know, I don't know, different ways. Of, like you want to display currency, for example. Um, so you can kind of look them up and use them as particularly for yourself, right? To try to understand whatever the data you're looking at is. Yeah. Is there a way to make all of the categories and percent like in one kind of code? Not in this code base. Like, um, yes, um, but no, you kind of have to go set them each individually. It's kind of like it seems in the example like something obvious that you'd want to do, but in fact, it's mo most likely going to cause you to make an error 
because not all of these columns are percentages. So you should kind of think about each one. Um, so you can do it more efficiently than this. Um, yeah. If you were reading like a table that had a percentage values, and it could have been a branch with percentages over, or is it just going to be I think you mean if it has the percent character in it. Right, that had percent characters. I think it works. Um, it's so rare for me to use anything like that. I I would almost always store it like this um, because I don't want to. I don't want the the challenge is Excel may do it one way, Google Sheets may do it another, Python may do it a third way. There's probably not actually that many options, but you know the because of the lack of consistency of the types of things that might read a comma separated value file. I as a you know, individually, I try very hard to make sure that everything is kind of as simple as it can be. And then if I want to display it differently, I do it as a display activity rather than a storage activity. So like, I would never put a dollar sign in there either. Even if I want to clarify, you know, in that column, that is dollars, right? It's not yen, you know, it's not, you know, UK pounds or something. It is dollars. But I still wouldn't put a dollar sign in the data. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, let me see what else I want to show you. Um, there's actually a bunch of other things we could do there, but we're going to stop on that one. Um, so I think we have 10 minutes left. I don't know if we have time for this question. Um, but it might be useful to kind of, oh, I forgot to switch screens for you. Um, so we are actually going to skip it, um, but as kind of a, let me go back, go back, there we go. As kind of an exercise for the reader, it might be worthwhile to think about this, okay? So you have the Dubois file, okay? Um, but if you can look at the table functions we've learned and find the income bracket class that spent the highest percentage of their income on rent. Um, this is not an assignment, it's a you know QED exercise for you. Uh, if you want to play around with it some more, it might be a good exercise to practice with. Um, if you want somebody to check it, feel free to bring a by office hours uh, and we can talk it over and see if you did it the right way. All right, I think that was a, a question for the class, but I don't think we have time for it today. So theoretically, I'm gonna skip that. We're gonna talk a little bit about attribute types. Okay, so this is kind of like, no, it's just something completely different, okay? So when we talk about a column, okay, in a table, um, uh, let me try and figure out how to say this. Um, so, uh, so when we talk about them, we have two different ones. I should really combine these and have like an intro slide, but we have two different ones. We have numerical and we have categorical, okay? And we'll get to the details of categorical in a second. But the difference is numerical are numbers, okay? And they are actual numbers. They're really treated as numbers versus categorical, which is more like a class or a set, okay? So, for example, when we talk about um, the, one, you know, the ranges of salaries, right? The 100, 200, and I'm going to make this up, 200, 300, 300, 400, those aren't actual numbers, right? They're really categories, you can't really directly compare those per se, okay? You can try and subtract them, but they're really kind of like categories, okay? Your BUID, okay, is a number, right? Your, your actual user ID, uh, um, like student ID, not your Kobos ID. But your student ID is a number, right? But subtracting one from another isn't gonna tell you anything, theoretically. A lot of ID systems are actually counters, so it might, but for the sake of argument, that ID is really categorical. It's not numerical. Does that make sense? And this is an important distinction because you can only do certain kinds of operations on numerical fields, and you can only do certain kinds of operations on categorical fields. And often they are not interchangeable. For example, subtraction. You can do that on a numerical field, but you cannot subtract chocolate from strawberry. Although I'd be very interested in someone trying. That makes sense? Okay, so if you think of student ID numbers as the equivalent of chocolate and strawberry, okay, that's why you can't subtract them. 
because they don't they don't have any meaning as numbers. They just happen to be digits. All right. So this is an important uh, distinction. Um, this is the kind of thing that is likely to be brought up on an exam. Um, and you know the key here right, is so uh, so numerical inch value is from a numerical scale of some kind. Maybe it's floats, maybe it's ints, maybe it's positive numbers, maybe it's negative numbers, whatever. They're all numbers, but usually there's a scale in which they must fit. Um, and then categorical is a value from a fixed inventory. Okay, and so an inventory is um, it, is anyone who played like Minecraft? Anyone played Minecraft? All right. All those things that you have to select from, you know, with all the different blocks and all that stuff, that's your inventory. Okay. So um, a fixed inventory is just basically, you know, the inside of your bag. Okay. That's an inventory. So a set of things, um, except in this case, it's usually like a set of labels. Okay. Or, or things like labeling things, like student IDs. There's only a certain number of EU student IDs in the world. Okay. So there's a fixed inventory. It grows. But at any given point in time, it's fixed. All right. Oh boy. All right. So um, we're not going to get to the census today too much. Uh, we'll probably cover it on Thursday instead because the census data, like US census data, is like used all over the place in data science. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the census itself first. Who here knows what the census is? All right. Can somebody tell me? Who else tell me? Basically taken every 10 years and it's have the population of the entire US, including like information about the people, so gender, age, range. Right, so I'm gonna skip this. Taken every 10 years, okay. Um, and in fact, in the US, it's part of the US constitution. And the fact that it's every 10 years is part of the US Constitution. Okay, so it must be done on that periodicity, and it is used basically to define the government. Okay, so basically the number of people you have at the federal level, even at the local and state level, is usually directly reflective of the US Census. Um, and it's used, it's used to determine representation. Um, However, it is estimated by the bureau who does it, okay, so the national, like the federal bureau, it's called the US Census Bureau, um, estimates what the values are every year as well based on what they think the trends are. Um, so this came up as a very big deal, uh, not too long ago, like within the last four or five years, um, because they were trying to introduce new questions into the census that might get more people to not answer the census. Okay, and what happens if, for example, if you have a population in, say, um, Boston, okay, and if some portion of that population of Boston is afraid to answer the census, what does that mean for Boston's representation at the state level and national level? It goes down, right? So as a political maneuver, there was a group of people who are trying to make it scary to participate in the census to drive the basically the, the other side was the where was mostly represented by people in areas like Boston, right? So in places like Boston, it would be scary to take the census. So they would win because the people in Boston would be represented less at the highest levels. What's another problem with underestimating the census? So this is the political side, but there's another big problem. Uh, not you behind you. Yeah. For resources that are right, so resource allocation is is mismanaged, right? We don't we don't necessarily know how, right? Maybe, maybe too much in one place, too little in another. But we mismanage, right? We can't allocate resources correctly because we don't know what that census population is. Um, this is another big reason why we want, like it's in the interest of most people in the U.S. for the census to be as accurate as possible. Most other countries also have something like the uh, census, um, but this has actually been going on for quite some time in a very consistent way. And so it's often used really heavily in things like data science because of its consistency. Um, the downside to some of its consistency is that it has some really antiquated mechanisms of collecting data um, so that it's 
what's called backwards compatible. Does anybody know what I mean by backwards compatible? Oh, how about that? Right, right. So it's, you know, it's kind of right there, right? It's compatible with prior versions. So what is really useful in the census is if I can compare the data between now and 100 years ago, right? So that's, so we try, generally speaking, to make it backwards compatible so it'll be compatible with that stuff. So for example, the sex column, the gender column um, in the census data is limited to one and two, okay, male and female, even though we're starting to think that maybe those aren't good values, okay? However, they are integers, and it's important that they're integers because of that backwards compatibility. So the likelihood you see a change in the census to, to reflect 